Thank you very much for uh, this honor. Um, I, it's, uh, it's of course a bit emotional. Uh, we are very thankful that uh, you chose to, uh, to install this, uh, this uh, memorial uh, prize for Matthias Rippmann. Um, we also shared this with his family who are very moved and very thankful that you are doing this. So I hope that this can be indeed uh, a nice way to remember our friend, colleague and long-term collaborator and, uh, and, and esteemed kind of colleague for many of us in this field and, and to celebrate maybe his uh, too short career and um, what he already contributed. Um, I, I will do a combination between uh, sharing what we do and uh, to, uh, to provide the framing. Uh, uh, and then I will uh, zoom in into uh, indeed Matthias's work and also share some updates on, on hopefully uh, how we can hopefully continue his work in the future. Um, so to start, uh, I, for those of you who have seen uh, some of my lectures, you know that I start here always, but I think it's something that needs to be repeated continuously. There needs to be more awareness of this uh, gigantic challenge we are facing, that in the next 30 uh, years, there will be at least 2.1 billion more people on the pl planet, which is roughly a 20% increase of the world population. Bill and Melinda Gates calculated for us in 2019 that, uh, what, that, what that means towards construction and towards building materials in order to provide housing and infrastructure for all these people that still need to be born. Uh, we need to build the equivalent of one New York City every month for the next 40 years. That is a huge challenge indeed, not just because of its quantity, not just because of just the logistics of it all, but also because of this sad reality. These numbers are of course rounded up, but uh, I chose to put this slide up here. These are global contributions of our industry, global contributions towards emissions. So that is direct pollution, man-made greenhouse gas emissions, um, global uh, contributions to resource consumption, uh, and particularly problematic is the irresponsible uh, use and rapid depletion of natural resources, global production of waste, and then global energy production. And we are very close to 40% in all of these topics. This is something that we need to be fully aware of, and uh, we need to take action. We need to be responsible as design teams, as builders, as people that have a direct influence on this. So we need to really challenge and question our outdated ways of construction. I hope that with these few words, you might all agree that we really need that change. We need to, to change the way we design structures and also how we build. And this community, I believe is exactly central and has all the right tools and, and kind of skill sets to really be, uh, to be able to provide that, that, that uh, desperately necessary uh, disruption, this, this change of uh, this paradigm change in construction and design. Uh, my group uh, that I co-lead together with uh, Tom van Meele and uh, until last year also Matthias, um, we demonstrate that there is a lot of uh, um, better uh, to be gotten uh, through uh, by activating a geometry. So Sharjah already talked about this but also something that we call material effectiveness, which is not necessarily the same as material efficiency. And I will uh, 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 clarify that nuance later. And then obviously, um, in order to provide uh, an integrated design approach, which I believe is absolutely necessary to, to go forward, uh, we, we, we use the opportunities offered by computational design and now the, the digital fabrication at a real construction scale to offer, uh, uh, to offer opportunities to challenge the status quo. So let's first look at computational design and digital fabrication. Mariana already shared that uh, indeed, if you do develop a system that you embed in a design pro uh, uh, process and a computational strategy to then uh, propose an innovative uh, digital fabrication approach, that you can literally use a sweater that is so lightweight that it can be brought on site in a suitcase to make a quite sophisticated shell. Of course, this project was together with Zadit Architects and uh, Rex. 
but also on other, we, we do more of these kind of things in, in, in our group because uh, it's not sufficient to provide tools to generate efficient structural form. Uh, you also need to realize these non-standard geometries. And so we have explored, for example, these cable net fabric formwork systems to generate these large super thing, uh, um, in this case, a concrete shell. So what you're looking at here is uh, spans of 20 by 10 meters with only three to uh, eight centimeters of concrete. So really an efficiency that you couldn't get uh, and would just not be feasible, again, like Sharjah showed, because the foam works are the bottleneck there. What's neat is that, um, so we started with designing tools to explore structural form. Then we wanted to demonstrate and find ways to efficiently construct them. But the real bottleneck is actually technology transfer. And, and, and that is really where you have to leap and start working with industry in practice, not just for demonstrators, but for real projects. We're lucky that, for example, here, the Nest uh, unit uh, on the uh, uh, HILO, that we have such an opportunity to challenge our tools and to work with industry to develop uh, something different. So here you see a very small crew assembling this flexible formwork. Um, the building site is not just uh, beautifully clean uh, because it's Switzerland, but uh, because it really is designed uh, uh, to be very efficient and easily assemblable. And indeed, this openness, this free space that one gets, rather than having the scaffolding and the formworks that cause much of these inefficiencies, um, are not there so that other parts of the construction can go on on the ground floor. Um, a reality, though, is that if you push the bounds uh, so far, is that it's hard to find actually uh, people in industry that want to take the risk. So the people here assembling this non-standard formwork for a non-standard optimized geometry is uh, our own research team. So the BRG is not only form-finding experts, but apparently also a non-standard formwork provider. Um, which is, of course, uh, satisfying and exciting, but also, again, maybe highlights uh, the real uh, challenges in who is actually taking the risk, who is leaping with us to transfer new ideas into practice indeed. This is actually a quite cool uh, video for us because this is three weeks ago. Um, con final construction actually uh, finally started, and I'm happy that the first of the two layers of the, the, the sandwich concrete shell have been cast, so this project is well under its way. One thing that I do want to absolutely emphasize is that nothing about this uh, can, can be done without computation. And that is where we, as a group, but also within the NCCR, have been developing the open source computational framework Compass for many years now to allow a collaboration between researchers, first and foremost, but also to, uh, to actually act as a lightweight hub between, uh, between researchers, the gray bubbles, but then also between industry partners, many of which uh, that, uh, that don't necessarily have uh, this uh, digital and technical know-how in-house. So this kind, of, this kind of new platforms allow really to, uh, uh, to sneak in innovation in, in, real, in real context, but it also allows a much smoother kind of connection between all the different disciplines and expertises and that you can uh, do something that is significantly better than uh, a BIM standard would offer. The key thing though, what I want to share and what we, what we stand for is what you can achieve by strength through geometry. As maybe some of you know, I did my uh, PhD at MIT in, in providing a new method to assess the safety of these historical structures in unreinforced masonry. So they're standing for centuries without any reinforcement and uh, because they have a good form. And that is indeed where um, uh, my PhD work was translated by Matthias Rippmann into tools that allow to explore this kind of uh, new structural forms. But because anything is possible on the computer, we took 2016 Venice Biennale to actually demonstrate that these things really could change everything, that you could uh, find these beautiful geometries that have no reinforcement. These are cut stone pieces held together by geometry, no reinforcement, no glue, just equilibrium at play. And we did this to hopefully, and I think we might have managed to a certain extent, shake up the community 
the colleagues in engineering, but also in architecture to demonstrate not only the beauty, the potential beauty, but also really the structural redundancy and robustness of double curve geometry indeed. So this was an important milestone project for us, but of course this was not the first project that we did. And it's important to acknowledge that we have done so much prototyping and demonstrators and prototypes are essential. By the way, it's Matthias that is holding the sledgehammer. This was a very exciting day. The first um, scale prototype of the, that maybe my PhD uh, was, was worth it. So we look often to the past to rediscover techniques like here tile vaulting, which comes from uh, uh, Catalonia. And uh, uh, during my PhD, I was happy, uh, lucky to be involved in this project. And I showed this very old project uh, because it's, it was for me one of the most eye-opening um, um, uh, learning experiences and something that I want to share with you because it really clarifies what really strength through geometry means. So not only could we activate local laborers to learn this new technique that doesn't, that is extremely efficient, produces practically no waste with local materials and so on and so on. But the key point here is that the materials was just locally pressed soil, a super weak material that had to be carried in very small packages, very carefully on site, because these tiles would just break into your hands. And on the left, you see that if you place these weak materials where the forces want to go, this becomes a totally safe structure. And so this to me really made clear why we should uh, favor and reintroduce these efficient geometries. So not only to make uh, grand spaces, but also, as I said, to use uh, very local, weak, non-polluting resources to, for example, uh, use uh, um, uh, recycled contents. This is compressed Tetra Pak in New York, or even uh, to use geometry to make, in this case, mycelium bricks uh, fully structural and stable and safe for a one year exhibition piece of uh, four by four meters um, uh, height. These demonstrations, just to kind of uh, clarify that I think more of us should really push these kind of ideas because we need indeed to be much more responsible towards um, our resources. Particularly because another way to translate this one New York City every month for the next 40 years, I mean, the, the task is just gigantic, is that we need to almost, it's, it's again, I'm an engineer also, so I round things up or down. Uh, this is a slight exaggeration, but we need to almost double the existing floors, uh, floor area in the world. So everything that has been built roughly needs to be built again on the same planet. That's how much we need. And that is where I want to directly also say that these kind of geometries are not just for special structures. They can really help also in the most banal, most pragmatic kind of elements like floor slabs. And we focus as a group on floor slabs because this uh, pie chart of the weight distribution in, uh, in a multi-story building, at least 10 stories, so 10 floors and higher, this is a typical image you see. That's uh, three quarters of the weight of that building is in the structure, which makes us conclude that the structure is mainly there to keep itself up. Of that three quarters, more than half is in spanning space in the floors. So the floors are really such a wasteful and polluting kind of element. And by indeed reintroducing uh, geometries that we somehow have forgotten in our both architectural and engineering vo vocabulary, we can for free um, save more than 70% of materials. And that is then what we uh, have been developing also as a floor slab, which we already showed in the, in the Venice Biennale in 2016, but where we are also, because this then becomes the new challenge, is how can we, how can we basically challenge the status quo? This, this system of building these highly polluting, inefficient floor slabs in concrete, most of it in concrete. Concrete doesn't want to be a beam. It, it, it wants to be an arch, uh, uh, being uh, as it is an, an in a way, a hybrid artificial sandstone. So here also trying new techniques like full-scale sand 3D printing to make these structural components. I showed this because this was uh, the last work that Matthias did in our team 
in preparation of now a, a startup and a spin-off where he, he demonstrated that even that very weak 3D printed material can take all the loading cases required. You see Matthias uh, checking uh, here the, the test going until uh, uh, final collapse. You have seen this image already before. Uh, Shaji also showed it, but we, if, you, if we want to, we can celebrate the beauty, the elegance, the natural elegance that comes out of, uh, of uh, structural geometry. But the reason that we do this is not just to, again, have a nice paper to be invited uh, for presentations and so on, because this looks sexy. No, the reason for this is, again, because we need to construct all these high rises. And that is why we, uh, now for a project that we started, uh, we have done a very simple calculation for the client. Uh, for a 25 story building here, uh, starting from a very simple core building, so uh, with, with moderate span, uh, spans and so on. So for one building, we did the calculation. So when you look at the flat slabs on the left, so that is the status quo, that would be the standard um, code, code uh, compliant kind of floor systems. If you introduce post tensioning, then you can uh, on the floor slabs reduce 20%. The high low floors, okay, uh, we bu are building them in the same unit as where you saw the crazy roof happening. Uh, this will be the first uh, uh, in practice fully certified and engineered and, and, and approved kind of uh, implementation of this super thin lightweight floor. But so we had to be a little bit conservative and the RFS, RFS stands for Ripman Floor System, uh, will actually save uh, at least 70% of materials. If you calculate this on the top, total volume of the building, because you not only have the floors, you save 35% of concrete. All of this might sound very abstract, so that is why I, we translated what that really means, is that for that one building, you save 7,500 cubic meter of concrete. That is how much concrete less you need in that building. And again, if that sounds very abstract, then let's look at uh, this reality. That would mean that if you were to build this building with concrete trucks, that you would need 1,208 concrete trucks less to go to this building. This is just for one building. But the key benefit is actually in the reduction of steel we save more than 90% of steel. Again, there you see the high-low floors. These are real floors. They are under construction right now. You see that we almost save 90% compared to what the alternative floor slab would be in reinforced concrete, but we will do even better. Per floor, that would mean 20 kilometers of steel bars less per floor, right? And so the key, the key message here is not just all the savings, but why do we do these savings is basically the bottleneck is the embodied carbon coefficient. So the emissions, the pollution that we are having. So everyone labels concrete as a necessary evil or um, uh, causing all the problems in the world. Well, here, look at this graph. Uh, the blue, uh, the blue uh, identifies concrete. Concrete is not that bad as a material. If we were to use it, like for example, we propose, if we were to use it how it wants to be used and not in the bulk, in the inefficient, uh, irresponsible ways that we do. But the red that I highlighted, the steel is much more polluting. And so that one we want to reduce almost entirely. And that is where these historical principles of compression shape of funicular geometry can really uh, shine and bring the added benefits indeed. Again, uh, I want to shake everyone because this is that reality, right? That we need to build all these high rises and the way we do it now with our 40, 40, 40, 40 contribution towards uh, uh, decay of the planet, this is not responsible. In that context, I'm extremely pleased to be able to announce that this month, exactly this month, so a couple of days ago, we started a one year intensive uh, uh, industry supported development phase. So in a year from now, uh, maximum a year and a half from now, we will have uh, a system uh, that is fully certified and that can be used in real projects. So basically in a year from now, you will have a 70% light, a one sixth of the embodied carbon alternative for uh, your floors. This is a nice outlook, but for me, perhaps even more important is where most of these people will still uh, come on the planet. It's not in, in my context. It's not in Europe, for example, but it's in Asia, Asia particularly uh, India, 
and then Africa. And in that, in that sense, I, I find myself super privileged that we are developing versions of the rip mount floor system with the government of South Africa and with developers in India, there where it really will matter. So the message of what we try to do is that, or what I'm trying to share is that structural geometry allows us to use less material that is good, but not sufficient. That is where funicular forms or compression geometries allow us to use better material, material that is less polluting because we can activate in a safe way uh, uh, lesser strength material, uh, uh, material, and then through computational methods and digital fabrication, the key challenge is how can we realize those non-standard geometries not producing all the waste uh, that is typically associated with it. So with that, I also want to really frame why we are pushing tools and why Matthias did develop Rhino Vault is basically to share tools that are not black box, that are open, where the designer can really start to understand the relation between geometry and equilibrium. The relation between geometry and equilibrium is not new, of course. I mean, we have famous examples like Gaudi, as Professor Shea also uh, showed, with the famous invert, inversion model of something that hangs as a, as a pure tension solution. If you freeze that geometry and you flip it over, then it becomes a very efficient compression shell indeed. Um, more local for us in Switzerland, another example of these inverted hanging models is of course the famous shell builder, Heinz Isler. So this principle is not new of the inversion of the hanging model, uh, and, but it's also very painful to make these models. It, it, it uh, demands also a certain attitude and that's where people developed graphic statics where the geometry of a structure and the forces in it were explored at the same time. So these two diagrams that you see in every little square here in this book from 1873 is basically um, a graphical, an understandable, an intuitive representation of both the geometry and the forces at the same time. This is also uh, what we teach our students and we basically develop these methods to uh, enhance them through uh, modern parametric uh, frameworks in order to be able to extend the solution space and to get rid of the tediousness of having to do all of these calculations, these graphical calculations by hand. And that was then the starting point for what I developed for my PhD, TNA, um, uh, at MIT with John Oxendorf. And that then, uh, again, was the starting point for Matthias's PhD, who took the theoretical framework, which by itself is useless, to, to shape this into a very user-friendly tool that uses on the left a, a form diagram which layouts where forces will go in 3D and a force diagram where you as designer can really actively start to manipulate forces by stretching elements and this stretching means attracting forces because how to read the force diagram is just by measuring the lengths. So the longer the little length, uh, the length of an element, the more force you attract. And so here you will see that then that means a local force attraction indeed. That then allows to, to start challenging this kind of boring uh, design context. So a circular support, does it only need to be a dome? Can we not develop other kind of ideas by playing with the topology of forces and by non-uniformly redistributing the forces in the system? So all of this became possible because of uh, the tools that Matthias implemented. And uh, to our surprise, it was absolutely mind blowing that more than 30,000 people downloaded Rhino Vault and started to exploring these, these, these non-standard geometries that were efficient at the same time. And, and what surprised me even more is that this tool is actually quite painful. It's, it's not just like most of our tools where you hit a button and you get a solution. You know, as a designer, you really need to start to understand those relationships indeed. So here, um, also for example, for the armadillo vault that I showed earlier, uh, these methods were done uh, to do the initial form finding and, and, and sketching, basically digital sketching indeed. These are images from Matthias's PhD, so quite outdated from 2016, where he shows uh, different patterns, different projects we have done with it. But then to our surprise, all over the world, people started using uh, these tools initially mainly for demonstrators and prototypes, but then for real buildings. Like here, the beautiful Bricktopia project in Barcelona by MAP13 Architects. 
that was one of the first large-scale uses of Rhino Vault in practice. This made Matthias realize that we desperately and urgently needed a disclaimer in our tool that, um, that uh, we are not responsible for the final engineering of whatever is being generated in Rhino Vault. A lot of workshops still, like here in Melbourne with uh, Tim Shork. The still world record, Guinness world record for largest 3D printed structure um, in 2015 that was also designed with Rhino Vault, uh, very different types of geometries. And then of course, I am extremely thankful of, of, of Philip Yuan and his team um, promoting and understanding the value of such design processes and starting to really do big and meaningful kind of uh, structures based of, on Rhino Vault. So I, I want to just emphasize that how, how proud actually this uh, div uh, development in China um, uh, was to us, uh, this development that really was pioneered by Philippe Yuan. So really thanks a lot for that. And, and Philippe, you know that uh, Matthias was absolutely beyond, uh, super excited about what, what you have done with his very humble tools, right? In India, lo uh, local laborers with Sami Padora and his team of architects uh, and associates doing this fantastically beautiful uh, uh, tile vaulted shell um, uh, done really with, with very humble budgets, very uh, local ro resources, but uh, uh, um, an, efficiency, uh, an, an efficiency uh, achieved because of the structural geometry indeed. How cool is it to be able to build in a context where you don't need handrails? So these are actually the happy teachers of this elementary school. Uh, it's a little library extension building. But again, then coming back to China and, 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 and pushing it to yet again that next level. Uh, here I was fortunate to, to team up again with Philip Yuan in this MIT um, uh, uh, co-teaching that we did, really challenging also how to form these structures, but also new overlapping geometries. Um, here you see that Philip is very happy. I'm not that happy because I am extreme. I have extreme vertigo and I'm shaking on my legs here. So it looks like I'm excited and, and yelling something out of excitement. I'm actually yelling to the photographer, you to say like, please take that picture because I'm dying. Um, but then again, uh, um, look at this, look at this absolutely surprising, stunning shell that was designed with Rhino Vault. Thank you so much, Philippe, Archie Union and, and Fab Union to take these tools to absolutely the next level of things that we could not imagine. So Matthias's tools had a lot of impact, but um, the development was stopped. He was planning to develop Rhino Vault 2 to be compatible with Rhino 6 and 7. Uh, now we have Rhino Vault 2, which is an extension of the open source uh, framework Compass, which basically means that it's not a tool by itself, but it's actually an, an application. It's a wrapper of the entire Compass um, uh, ecosystem. So that means that you can use Rhino Vault 2 for some sketching. You can do this in, in Rhino. Very soon you will be able to use it in Blender, in the browser, in whatever you want, and you will be able to extend uh, your designs with all the features that the Compass framework then offers. So you can start to analyze it with a, in a fee. You can start to fabricate non-standard architectural geometry based on your starting geometries and so on and so on. These things are, uh, this kind of new uh, approach to Rhino Vault is what we explored with the very first users of Rhino Vault 2, which were the workshop uh, participants uh, in this digital future online um, uh, craziness. We did a four-day workshop and uh, we, we overloaded the students with new features, with a lot of tutorials, all the way from form finding and structural ideas to full materialization, making blocks and basically making a small version of the armadillo vault just in three days time. And then we let the students loose in the evening to develop their own designs. So in just three days, they generated this beautiful kind of uh, uh, expressions that are also fully materialized. So uh, this is not just the geometry, but also already real voussoirs. Um, uh, this uh, cute little shell by Avi uh, uh, res uh, responding to the boundary conditions of we, we gave uh, we, some, some nicely balanced um, uh, form and force diagrams emerge to generate very surprising soaring shapes. Some new features like here, the turning inside out by Qatar, 
um, really kind of made me kind of scratch my head. And this was a feature that I had never seen before. So it was super exciting to see that with this tool that worked super smoothly, that actually the students started to challenge what we understood from uh, equilibrium and compression equilibrium. Very simple manipulations of the force diagram that allowed to add a crease in the geometry to then when you scale this up to the scale of the building that you actually could indeed have a shell without railings because the crease provides the physical barrier to not fall off the shell. So these were fun things that the students uh, uh, did with us. Uh, we were very thankful of their excitement. Their, they worked super, super hard as I'm sure all students in all uh, um, in, in, in all workshops, but again, this digital futures um, um, a setup seems to bring the best out of all the participants, not only the teachers, but first and foremost, all the students. Some projects are just so beautiful in their form and force diagram that they don't need anything else. And then wild propositions of fully overlapping Möbius-like uh, design, designs with here maybe a little bit of overkill in the amount of people uh, climbing over this little shell. So thank you, these are not all of you, but thank you again to all the students that joined. Some of them like Neil uh, earlier uh, started with us at five in the morning or, or others uh, had to go all night because they joined from all over the world. This was exciting. And in that context, I want to say that we are committed and we will remain committed to sharing because the challenges that I talked about earlier are so gigantic that we need to work on all of this together. And that is why I just wanted to list these three resources that we, that we developed uh, on purpose to be shared open source with everyone. Equilibrium is our teaching platform. So if you want to see, see and find all my lectures, all our ex exercises, all the tools that we develop for our students at ETH, everything is available there. RhinoVol2 is now a fully open source framework that extends Compass, which is the framework if you want to uh, start to um, share your research in, 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 in a fully reproducible uh, kind of way with colleagues and if you want to uh, improve your efficiency in exchange between different disciplines. So with that, I thought it was appropriate to just final, finally actually again acknowledge and thank you for this big honor that you give to us as a group, but also to Matthias um, he, he went uh, too fast. It was a very tra tragic accident as well. And I hope indeed that this prize can be a celebration of excellence, an excellence that he brought, a passion that he brought. He was a passionate designer. He was an innovator. He was the coolest guy. He was a pillar of the BRG together with uh, uh, Tom and I. Um, he was also our best friend. He was just the nicest person. Uh, this is Tom hugging uh, Matthias. But um, if you want to know more about him, then do check out his lectures all online. He was a naturally gif gifted speaker, both in English and in German. And particularly his TED talk is actually something that I would absolutely uh, recommend. So with that, um, I think it's appropriate to end my talk with uh, this uh, image. You see Matthias was in the middle of the image. He was also very much the middle. He was a cent central father role for many, many pe people in our team, but also uh, all the people that contacted him with questions of Rhino Vault. I don't know how he did it, but I think there is no single person that asked him a question of these 30,000 users that didn't get an answer almost immediately. So he was a fantastic person. With that, I want to say again, thank you so much for doing this for Matthias, for his family, for us. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.